I guess we can give a little bit of background on the observing program for tonight. Um, and then if folks have questions, just, you know, feel free to, uh, to, you know, put them in the chat or you can, un, you know, unmute yourselves or put yourselves on video, whatever works best. Um, but we're doing an observing program tonight in uh, a nearby spiral galaxy M33, which is the Triangulum Galaxy. Uh, and it is one of the closest spiral galaxies to our galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, and the specific targets that we're focusing on in this program are massive stars uh, that are in binary star systems with either a black hole or a neutron star. Um, we don't know actually whether they're black holes or neutron stars just yet, which is one of the goals of this observing program. Um, but these types of systems are called X-ray binaries. And that's basically because the, the star in the binary, um, so I guess I'll, the other way around. So the black hole or the neutron star, which is a compact object is accreting material uh, from that companion star, which forms a disc around the black hole or neutron star. Uh, and that disc is really hot and it emits, it emits um, really energetic light. And so we can observe it uh, with telescopes that observe at X-ray wavelengths. So that's how we initially found these stars. Uh, we were observing the X-rays from the black hole or neutron star using a different telescope. So a space-based X-ray telescope. Uh, and then we identified the star that was in the, the binary system um, using also data from a space telescope called the Hubble Space Telescope, which is probably one of the fam most famous uh, space telescopes. Um, and so we were able to identify these types of systems. And what our goal is with this observing program is to get more detailed observations of those stars. Um, so with Hubble, we have um, essentially photographs of the stars. So like images that just kind of are single snapshots of the star. And with what we're doing with this uh, telescope is we're actually getting spectra, which is basically where we take the light from that star and we split it up into all of its different wavelengths. And then we get a lot more information about the star using that. Um, and specifically, we're trying to see if we can find evidence of orbital motion. So these, the star and the black hole are in a binary. Uh, it's actually pretty much like the black hole or neutron star is orbiting the star in these systems. Um, and so we're trying to see if we can essentially look for Doppler shifts uh, in the in the spectrum of the star that would tell us something about the orbital motion. Um, and if we can figure that out, then that can tell us things like what are the masses of the star and the compact object? Um, what is the composition and like evolutionary stage of the star? So we get a lot of information in that way. One of the questions that came up, Margaret, in the last session, uh -huh. people were asking about black holes. Um, the black holes we're looking at in this galaxy are not at the center. Uh, they're, right. So there may be a supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy. Uh, this certainly is at the center of our galaxy and Andromeda. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the black holes we're looking at are not supermassive black holes. They're stellar mass right. black holes. There are a few to 10 times the mass of the uh, sun, maybe yep. up to a few tens of the times the mass of the sun, but not hundreds or, or certainly not thousands or millions or billions. Uh, whereas the, the, for this galaxy, if, the, if it has a black hole at the center, it'll be of the order of a million solar masses. So mm -hmm. there's this distinction between these central black holes that are supermassive black holes, uh, supermassive in relation to the mass of the sun. Uh, versus the ones you're looking at, which are high mass X-ray binaries. And the high mass refers to the star yeah. um, that is donating the material to the black hole. But the black hole itself is um, yeah, more massive than the sun, but not in the aliens range. It's in the few or few tens range. Yeah. And... From what I understand, there's actually a little bit of debate about whether M33 has a supermassive black hole at the center, which is right. kind of interesting, right? Because there's debate about whether it has a bulge at all. 
And, yeah. uh, and the M sigma relation only applies to bulges of galaxies and not their disks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so these black holes are ones that would form through a, the evolution of a single star. So it would be massive enough that at the end of its life, its supernova explodes and then collapses down to form a black hole. And so a lot of the, the goal of this these observations is that we're, we're kind of looking at a population of these types of systems. Um, and we want to understand the evolutionary process of these massive binary star systems. Um, and at this point where you have a star, the X-ray binary phase where you have a star in a binary with a compact object, that's kind of, it's like an intermediate phase. Like they had both started off as, as stars and then they'll both end up being compact objects. And so this is kind of an interesting chance to uh, observe them at kind of an intermediate phase in their evolution. And because they're so bright at X-ray wavelengths, because of that accretion disk around the black hole or neutron star, they're kind of easy, easy to observe compared to other evolutionary phases, <coughs> which is kind of part of why we observe them in this phase, because we can find them. <laughs> Naraja, have... I am gonna close out of my Zoom really quick. I, for some reason, my app is kind of bugging out and um, I'm just gonna try to re, I'm gonna exit this call and try to re-enter it on my iPad really quick. I'll be right back. No problem. In the meantime, if people have any questions, uh, people on Zoom, if you have any questions for me, you're welcome to unmute and ask. I'll do my best to answer. So there are four sets of displays four sets or multiple displays in this set this window and you'll say you'll see this one says control zero across the top um let's, i'll mark this back this is then control one control two and this is telescope status tell status oh. there we go i don't know why it was uh it was like I just couldn't see you, and I looked like I was muted, and my video was off. Okay, are you on? Um, um, I I have myself on view only for all of this, so that my uh, cursor movement doesn't interfere with anything you're doing. Uh huh. So would you be able to please switch the this tell status to the top window, unless, of course. Uh huh. Oh, there we go. Okay. That might be cool for people to see because uh, mm. you can see the individual stars in M33 in that guider image. Yeah. So basically, the, as the sky rotates throughout the night, we have to make sure the telescope's pointing where we think it's pointing. So we use bright stars uh, to guide the telescope. So we kind of track the position of those stars and we move the telescope with. The, the motion of the sky. Um, so that's pretty much what this is showing here. And then this is all the just information about where the telescope is pointing. Uh, basically all of that, what time is it? With like the standard time and sidereal time. And then this is all the um, weather information up at the dome on the summit. It's good, it looks like our humidity's dropped a bit. It was creeping up before. Okay. I don't know, Raja, I'm a little worried I, um, we got about, we got 40 minutes on the first mask and then the last two, we tried to, to observe it a couple times and then the tracking, the guiding wasn't working. So I just decided to move on. But I guess I worry now that maybe that wasn't the right decision. We should have stayed on it to get another 10 minutes or so. Um, 
So you got 40 minutes uh, instead of 60, but then you have data from, uh, for the radial velocity variations you're thinking about for the HMXPs. Yeah. It's hard to know what to do. I think it must. Have, I assume it was clouds that affected your the third yeah. exposure. Yeah. It really depends on how bright their optical counterparts are and what lines mm -hmm. they have, etc. So uh, the ones you're looking at at. On this mask or, or the this mask and the previous one, the AGNs have been thrown out. Is it the quasars have been thrown away? It's only the HMXP candidates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this, this 20 minutes have flown by. Well, it hasn't been 20 minutes quite yet, but it's uh, been 17 minutes and just flown by. You, you just started it and it's, it feels like you just started it, but it's nearly mm -hmm. done with exposure. And then we, when the exposure is done, we can look at the, actually one thing that may be fun to do is I'm going to switch to control one. And mm -hmm. um, if it's okay, I can uh, unmute and just, uh, bounce around here so you can see the alignment boxes and the stars. Yeah. Um, let's see, what is, I, I have a question here. Nothing fundamentally different, uh, Kiros. It's, uh, it's the amount of control um, uh, number of people who can control safeguards, etc. Those are different between large and really large and small telescopes, but APO Apache point is also controlled remotely. That's a two and a half. There's a two and a half meter. There's a three and a half meter there. This one's a bigger telescope. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, to answer Darsh. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, there's a group of us who are at the, in Hawaii operating the telescope um, and um, there's actually four of us uh, who are in Hawaii operating or um, running the experiment, operating the telescope. So it's not a particular application, uh, but we, uh, well, I suppose VNC is virtual network computing. That's what we're using to, um, to access the screen, well, access the uh, screen that's being displayed by a computer that's on the mountaintop with the telescope, but with the beauty of virtual network computing, our laptops can display the screen just in the same way that it would if we were, we would see the same, we are seeing the same thing that we would if we were logged in physically into one of the screens associated with the computer on the mountaintop where the telescope is. So we are using something called virtual network computing, VNC. And you'll see that at the top of each of the shared screens. It says VNC Viewer. That's what VNC stands for, Virtual Network Computing. And of course, that's been around for a long time. Are you getting a gray box where the chat window is? Me? Over it on Zoom? Yeah, on Zoom. Um. I mean, I just see the chat window like usual when I pull it up. Okay, yeah, yeah, because, all right, of course, of course. Complete. You, you do, okay. Yeah, the remote uh, observing stuff is kind of crazy. That It's like you get the exact same thing when I'm in my living room in LA <laughs> that you get when you're there. Yeah, I can actually show if I, since I'm on my iPad here, that, let's see if I can. Andy, I'm not yeah. getting much of a lag. Um, 
Okay, so I've got it hooked up to my TV at home so I can see all the, the screens. Wow. But yeah, the lag isn't bad. DCD readout complete. Now it's going to display the spectra. There you go. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so in that image, um, each column is the spectrum for one star. And so when, when we have, I wish I had one of the slit masks. I had, I used to have them at home, but I brought them to my office. Um, but there are these big uh, metal plates with like a little slit drilled in them at the exact position where each star we want to get a spectrum of. And then when the light comes into the slit, it spreads out and gets projected onto a CCD, which is like a camera chip kind of the same idea as, as any digital camera. And then we're looking at the image here of what that looks like. So we have each column is the spectrum of an individual star. I think we have about 200 stars on the mask. Right. And there are eight chips in Deimos. One, two, three, four across the bottom. Can you see my cursor as I move the cursor? I can, yeah. Okay, so it's chips one, two, three, four. Five is malfunctioning, six, seven, eight across the top. So the spectra run across pairs of chips, one and five, two and six, three and seven, four and eight. The short Unfortunately, I... one of the chips is out tonight. <laughs> I don't know if you mentioned that already. I did. I, I Yeah, chip five is out, unfortunately. and has been flaky for the last four years. Um, so we're planning an instrument upgrade. But... Um, let's see. Yeah, the spectra run vertically. Uh, we're at short wavelength at the bottom, long wavelength at the top. So wavelength runs along the y-axis. And these different bands, these different vertical bands are the spectra of individual slits. I can bring a slit mask and sh uh, hold it in front of the camera. I might stop. I might uh, do that while uh, and stop sh sharing my screen so people can see it in a bigger window. Uh, I'll go do that. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll come back with a slip mask. I can go back to sharing my screen in a moment after that. Great. We go. Just one of these masks, Margaret. Mm -hmm. This is an align. These are some alignment boxes. One there. Uh, there are four of them. Almost in a. Three of them are in a, a vertical line. There's a fourth one. Um, there are three in sort of a um, near diagonal line here, and then there. Those are used to make sure the telescope is pointed just right and the rotation is just right. And then the slits are where the science stars shine through. This is obviously, this is not the metal plate that's on the mountaintop tonight. Um, this one is um, here at the 2,500 foot level at the headquarters of the observatory. But there's a, a set of these masks that are on the mountain right now that are inside the spectrograph. And we get to select the one we want, almost like a jukebox. Once we select one, the instrument goes in, there's a um, selector that grabs onto the particular mask we've asked for, puts that into the light part, moves the other one out, and so on. So hold it for something like a dozen such masks, and you can, uh, you can choose any one of those um, tonight. So in the afternoon, they go in and insert the metal plates, uh, physically insert the metal plates. They have barcodes that uh, uh, that can get read in. You can see the barcode at the bottom there. Um, it reads in the barcode. So the instrument um, software can talk to this piece of hardware that selects the masks. And we can, uh, I'll share my screen in a moment uh, to talk about where the the selection happens. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Yeah. 
So in this window over here, in this pull down menu, Margaret, if you click on the N33002, we, we won't change the mask, but if you click on the, um, oh, I, I can do it. Yeah, the, oh, you did it, okay. Those are, the, those are the 12 or so masks that are loaded right now. MT13 is just an empty slot. That's... Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like a CD changer. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, back in the day, it used to have like a 12 CD changer or something. You could like load them in and they'd rotate around and feed in the right one. Yeah, so for when we're observing, um, since we pick the targets that we want to focus on, one of the steps of the process is about a month or so before your observing night, you have to submit essentially blueprints for those that slit mask, uh, which tells uh, them how to basically mill, like where to mill all of those slits and where to put the alignment stars. So we create those designs um, and then they get manufactured for us. And do they, Raja, they mill them on the mountain or do they mill them here and drive them up? Uh, they mill them on the mountain. Um, this, uh, the machine and the control software, all of that, though, that was developed at Santa Cruz. So initially they would mill masks in Santa Cruz and ship them. Mm -hmm. Then they would, um, then the folks from Santa Cruz came out and trained folks at Keck on the milling. Now, uh, ever since then, it's all been done at the summit. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, what is radial velocity? It's the component of the velocity that's along the line of sight, that is along the line connecting us to the astronomical object. Um, so that's, the, that's what's referred to as radial. If you imagine us to be um, yeah, that's why it's called radial velocity. It's the velocity that's either pointed towards us or away from us, uh, not the component that's perpendicular to that. That we can't measure. We can measure through Doppler shift. We can measure the component of the velocity of a light source that is either towards us or away from us. Rush, does that answer your question? Ah. Uh, um, Kiros asks a very good question. Since the telescope can be controlled remotely, what's the benefit of being at the observatory? Um, and the benefit is really, um, I feel one of the benefits is a sociological one. Um, a couple of things. One is when you're in your, um, well, for one thing, Margaret's not at the observatory. She's in LA. But so this question is really more for Lara and me. For me, I, I find that if I'm trying to do this from home or from my office, the distractions of everything else that's going on at home or the distraction of everything that's going on in my office are um, pretty overwhelming. And uh, I, e even if I observe from there, I find my attention is uh, can be distracted from emails that are coming in and I mean, it's not like I don't have access to emails now, but this I, that's why I say it's more of a sociological, psychological thing of saying I'm stepping away from my office. I'm going to focus on this yeah, for the nights I'm on the telescope. That's one. But I think the second thing is being able to uh, meet face to face with the people at the observatory who are experts on the instrument if something goes wrong. And um, for me, some of the outreach I'm doing on the islands and um Again, those face-to-face -face meetings are really valuable for me. Uh, I should introduce Lara. Lara, if you have a moment, I'll take my headset up. Yeah, I'll turn my... Uh, for a moment, I'll stop sharing so that you can see. Sure. There you are. Hi, everyone. I'm Lara. I'm a postdoc at Johns Hopkins University, um, and I work pretty closely with Raja um, on this M31 project we were observing in the first half of the night. And I also have a bunch of targets on Margaret's masks that she's kindly let me add in because um, her target density is a little lower than the maximum you can fit. 
so she's endowing themselves to me as well without filling in. And I'll just add quickly to what you said about um please, please. the benefit of of, of um being uh, at the observatory, at least for me, um, is the guarantee of a solid internet connection, which mm. um, is normally fine when you're doing it uh, remotely. But I have definitely had times, um, not for this observatory, but when I've been observing in Australia, um, and we have this thing called the NBN, the National Broadband Network, and sometimes they do maintenance on that. And they typically do maintenance on that at night, which is exactly when I am trying to observe. And that is a huge problem. Whereas if you're physically at the observatory, they have a guaranteed connection. And so yeah. that's you don't have to worry about. <laughs> yeah, the NBN is like a face palm. Yeah. <laughs> is that a what? A, a face palm. You've not, you've not heard this yep. term, Raja. Raja, you need to get hip with the kids. I know, but this is a face one. A face palm. You've never seen, it's a meme, it's like Captain Picard and he's like, you've never seen this. Embarrassment? And and like shame and like, well, yeah, how terrible. Yeah, okay. Face <laughs> palm. I heard face plant, which means falling flat right. on your face. No, 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 no face plant. Yes. What's his name? Yeah. Um, so Patrick Stewart. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think we had one other question in the chat. Um, yes, I should Robert, say. about where do the masks physically go in the viewing chain? What was the question again? Uh, where do the masks go physically in the like optics setup? Basically, oh, oh, they're at the entrance. Oh, that's a great question, actually. So, um, that um, the telescope, which is you know, it's really a mirror. It's the main component of the telescope, uh, the concave mirror. Its job is to focus light, so it takes parallel light that's coming from distant astronomical objects, that parallel light strikes this curved mirror, bowl-shaped mirror, creates a convergent beam. That convergent light, where it comes to a focus, that's called the focal plane of the telescope, that's exactly where this metal plate goes, in the focal plane of the telescope, because you want focused light of a star to go through these narrow slits. If the light is out of focus, then all of the light won't go through that narrow mm -hmm. cut in the piece of metal. So it's really important that the metal plate be put in the focal plane. So that is that focal plane is pretty much the um, where there's a handoff from the telescope to this thing called the instrument, the spectrograph. It takes this focused light, and from the inside of the instrument, it looks like a divergent beam that's coming from that slit. So then you have to collimate that light, that means you have a, a concave mirror to take that divergent beam, turn it back into a parallel beam. Um, you send it through the equivalent of a prism. We use a diffraction grating here on a prism. And that's the thing that splays out the this mixed white light into the 8,192 colors of the rainbow. That's how many pixels we have in the spectral direction. Uh, but all of that, all of what happens to the light after it's been focused, all of that happens inside the so-called instrument. So you have a telescope focusing light, sending it into an instrument. And that instrument could be a camera that takes pictures, or it could be a spectrograph that takes spectra. And DEMOS is able to do both. That's why the name DEMOS is actually Deep Imaging Multi-Object Spectrograph. So it can take images, but it can also take spectra multiple um, astronomical sources at once. In fact, there used to be a cartoon that showed the light path the sequence. In fact, I think it's still there. So let me share. 
screen again. So um, this sequence, even though it doesn't look like a, a um, it's not really a drawing, but this is the sequence. When light enters the instrument, it comes in through a hatch. Um, just an opening, like a trap door. You open that, light comes in. It's it's converging light. Where it would, where it converges, where it comes to a point, that's the focal plane. That's where the mass goes. So, so you see, um, if light, were, if the convergent beam were coming down from the top, the hatch would be first, then the slit mask. Uh, then in between the slit mask and the grating is a collimator mirror that we can't control. That's why it's not shown here. But that turns the light into parallel light that hits a grating. It's a reflection grating, reflects off the grating. Uh, the clamp controls the tilt of the grating. Uh, and then it goes through a filter and, um, and then into the camera. The shutter and detector have to do with the camera. So the old version of this software, the previous version of the software, actually had a cartoon that showed you the flow of the light. I can probably bring that up on a Demos web page if that would be helpful. Go off and maybe I'll go off and look for that. Yeah, and we're taking t three 20 minute exposures, ideally. <laughs> I'm looking for a good schematic to show off what Demos does. Found something, but it's really complicated. Mm. Okay, I'm going to show this, even though it's a little complicated.
This is what I mean by complicated, really complicated. So um, it says front hatch. So you can see that this blue thing can, this is, and the blue thing is in this vertical position, it's closed. When it's in the uh, horizontal position, it's open. So light comes in. from here Exposure to the complete. Let me wait for the, are we done with the, this mask or? No, that's just the second exposure. Okay. We've got one more. Okay. So light uh, comes in. It's Even though it's shown as an arrow, it's really a convergent beam that comes in here. Any For any given star, it's a convergent beam. You see this black line here that says focal plane. So light comes to focus in, in a, it's not really a plane, it's actually a surface. This should have really been, have been labeled focal surface. You can see, in fact, it's drawn as a curve. And the slit mask goes in that plane. In fact, you see this, this slit mask is this red uh, thing over here. Now, the FCS fibers are something I won't try to explain here, but the slit mask goes in the focal plane. Once light goes through the slit, it hits the DCD readout. Complete. mirror, because it's now got a divergent beam that has to be brought into focus. It strikes the collimator mirror, then it strikes the grating, which is right there, and then it goes through a series of lenses, and it's brought to focus uh, inside this yellow chamber that's liquid nitrogen cooled, and that's the detector. It says detector. That's where the CCDs are. Uh, the filter wheel is right there. Our the filter we're using right now is the GG455 filter, which is a, a long pass filter. It blocks light shorter than um, 45, uh, 455 nanometers. It's blocked, so we don't get second order effects in the spectrum. Um, anyway, that's the, and this is to scale. This is the size of a human being on that scale. That's why the human being is drawn there. They're not serving any other useful purpose other than yeah. provide a scale factor. And this thing that says Naismith platform, that's the name of the, um, the kind of focus you can have. Prime focus, uh, what's called Casper focus, today focus, this is called Naismith focus. So um, what happens is the light from the primary mirror, um, oh, sorry, light from the astronomical objects strikes the primary mirror, starts converging. Before it converges to a point, it it's a secondary mirror, which is a convex mirror, and starts coming back down again. And before it converges, there's a tilted flat mirror that sends it off to the side into the Naismith deck. So this Deimos, you can see a little bit of Deimos on here. This is um, a, a picture of the actual instrument. There's the hatch, the slit mask plane is, um, to access it, you'd have to go in through one of these slats here and the whole instrument is the size of a small room. Mm. But this is the cartoon I was looking uh, for. Yeah, this is a side view, it says, of the optical layout. Okay. Um, let me back to these controls. Yes, yeah, so you can see we're on, we're doing an exposure right now at the, there's that left panel called DMOS instrument control. And then at the bottom, there's that like box within it that says detector control. And then you can see that progress bar that tells you how far. So we're doing 1200 second exposures, which are 20 minutes. So we just started the third one. And it's up to three of those 20 minutes are about to be completed. It's counting yeah. up. And then this window over here shows you that it's on the third of three. So one of three finished, two of three, three of three is the exposure is going on right now. It's uh, uh, the device is collecting light. Right mm -hmm. now.
I'm going to switch to the control one so we can see the spectra. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing very much continuum. Very little, very faint. And I think this is a reflection of the conditions. So let's see. I'm going to turn on my, if it doesn't interfere with anyone, I'm just going to turn on my turn off view only and mm -hmm. navigate this for a moment. Thank you. Thank you all. Could you zoom in? So um, these are these eight silicon devices. I'm just going to zoom into a little bit more so we can see the spectra. Yeah, they're very faint. Um, this thing looks like a spectra, but it's a single line. It's a column, a bad column. The spectra we're interested in are these very faint light vertical streaks that run all, in, all the way up and down the band. Yeah, most slits show hardly anything. This is probably the most prominent one I've seen so far, this and then up and down. The horizontal bars, near horizontal bars, are caused by the Earth's atmosphere. There's, yeah, I guess you can see a few of them. They're quite faint. And I'm also seeing the seeing is not very good. Seeing is a term for um, how blurry or sharp the light of a star is. Wow, what is this thing? I wonder if this is scattered light or if it's really a broad emission line object. I wonder if this is a quasar. Yeah, I I don't know for sure that we ruled all the quasars out. Okay. Uh, well, but this I is not at the center of the slit. If, if it didn't, you know, if I didn't have to change the position of the slit mass just to accommodate them, I figured kind of why not? Yeah, sure. And I, I don't think this is one of your targets. It's too close to the slit end. Mm. So I, it could be a serendip that we picked up, a serendipitous object that happens to be a broad emission line. Close out. Yeah, very little. Look. Yeah, I can see continuing this one, this one, this one. Yeah, the horizontal bars are um, are caused by the Earth's atmosphere, and each one produces a rectangle uh, because that's the shape of the slit. The sh slit is shaped like a rectangle. The Earth's atmosphere glows equally bright um, in every part of that rectangular cut that's the slit. So, so you get repeated images of the slit. Um, different wavelengths get mapped to different locations. So these bars are basically repeated images of the slit, repeated because different wavelengths land in different locations. And the Earth's atmosphere glows at specific wavelengths and is sort of dark at other wavelengths, doesn't put out light at other wavelengths. To our eyes, it all looks dark, but to a telescope, the Earth's atmosphere glows at very specific wavelengths, especially in the blue part of, in the red part of the spectrum like we're looking at this upper part. If you go to the lower part, you see it's much quieter. There are very few of these um, horizontal bands. So this is what, where we are looking now is the green part of the spectrum. This is actually an intense green line produced by oxygen. Um, this is the same oxygen green emission line, 5577, that gives the northern lights and the southern lights their green color. So O1, oxygen one in the Earth's atmosphere. Again, up here, uh, there are lots of emission lines. Down here, the Earth's atmosphere is very quiet. That is 55.77, super bright. Thank <laughs> you. 
Raja, what did you, what were you observing on before uh, Keck? Um, you mean before I came to Santa Cruz? Mm -hmm. I was using the, a couple of different telescopes. I used the, right before I came to Santa Cruz, the two years before that, I was using a telescope in Australia, uh, the same telescope that Lara did her PhD on, right? The Anglo-Australian telescope, the AT, four meter, uh, with a spectrograph called AutoFib, A-U-T-O-F-I-B, like fibers. Auto because they could be automatically positioned in the focal plane. So instead of slits, you put fibers there, they collected the light. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, I was studying distant galaxies. Um, prior to that, I used the telescopes in Chile a lot. Uh, and the telescopes in Arizona. So first the telescopes in Chile, um, well, several telescopes in Arizona. I did part of my thesis in Arizona, part of it in Chile. And then um, I kept using those two sets of uh, telescopes at those two locations. Different, different telescopes, a bunch of telescopes owned by different institutions. Um, the mountaintop in Chile uh, had telescopes run by a few different institutions. Same, same for Arizona. Arizona, the part, it's southern Arizona, it's south of Tucson, southwest of Tucson is where the peak National Observatory is. These mm -hmm. are both national facilities that are um, funded by the National Science Foundation of the US and headquartered in operations headquarters are in Tucson. I'm still intrigued by that uh, streak of light that is the mission man. Where did I see it? Oh, there, there it is, right there. What's going on with that? Very broad. I'm looking to see if there are other emission lines on the same slit. I don't see anything else. It is. I'm going to run and use the restroom really quickly. I'll be right back. Oh, another emission line down here. Look at that, Lara. So that's definitely a quasar. Equally broad, and I bet with these two broad emission lines, we'd be able to nail down what the redshift is. Good point. There could be there could be H beta and H alpha if we're seeing here. But I wouldn't expect them to land so close to the end of the slit. So that's why I'm thinking so. 
You can see fringing on the detector. Wow. I should start copying over the data from Margaret's directories as well. Let me do that. Um, did you say no, uh, if you want to copy that, I, um, if you want to save it, I can copy it over. Um, and if you save it and move it to the, your data directory, I can just copy it from there. Oh, I can, I can turn off my... Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. No, no, let, let me do that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so in some of the windows I'm view only, in other windows I'm not. Let me make sure. Well, I just saw we have a couple questions in the chat we didn't answer. Kiros asked about detector five malfunctioning tonight. Uh, that means that we're going to lose half of the spectrum for all the stars that are on that. So if you can. Like there's the, you know, the eight chips, any star that's on that left fourth of the of the slit mask, we won't have the long wavelength end of its spectrum, but we will still have the short wavelength end of its spectrum. So Kiro specifically for like the high mass X-ray binary targets, we should probably be okay. We'd still get H alpha and probably at least a couple of other lines that we could use to measure the radial velocities. Um but yeah, we won't have the long wavelength coverage on those targets. And then is there a large difference in the composition, density, or distribution between CFER and spiral galaxies, assuming equal mass? Hmm. I guess CFER galaxy is just like a type of AGN. But I think you could have a Seifert galaxy that is a spiral galaxy. It's just a Seifert galaxy is a specific type of galaxy with an active galactic nucleus, uh, which is um, a supermassive black hole. So I think it, you could have pretty similar galaxies. The Seifert galaxy would just be one where the black hole is active, uh, whereas you know a non Seifert spiral galaxy might you can have like ours, for example, you know, we have a spiral galaxy with a supermassive black hole that's just not currently active. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Zero one H O K U. Okay. 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 Okay, I've finished the copying. So I'm in night 3A. I'm going to go to night 3B and start the Margaret's copying. We're getting close to the last exposure on this mask. So, okay. I'm going to, um, 
I guess once the exposure is complete, I'm going to mute myself on this so that I can unmute myself over here and talk to um, Tony. No problem. What number does your um, uh, is the first of your exposures? Um, so mine were numbered starting with one. It's interesting. Laura and I were noticing that you know we did the the arcs and flats on the two different programs on the pig and. They kind of both numbered starting from one. No, but because then, they're considered different programs. So normally yeah. they go to different people and there's no uh, overlap. In our yeah. case, what we, uh, there won't be any overlap because the only uh, raw files that are, I, I've separated night three into three A and three B. Because gotcha. we have uh, night one, which is our first half night, night two, which is the whole night, and uh -huh. night three, I've split it up into three A, three B. So I've copied all of the first half files and logged yeah. it to 3A. Exposure complete. What I'll do is I'll take 3B, combine okay. it. With the, I'll add to it the data that we collected on that one mask. On gotcha. uh, I think 001B. We, we observe one of your masks on yeah. Saturday night. Two of them? Uh, or oh, 2B? Uh, two. Yeah. Two. Okay. Hey, Raja, sorry. I'm, I need this. I'm going to... Um, just mute myself on this really quick so that I can uh, get us moved to our next mask. Okay, sorry. Okay, of course. Oh, no. Hey, CCD readout complete. Margaret, are you Demos one? Or are you a different number? I'm Demos one. Okay, okay. I'm starting to copy over the data. Okay, great. <laughs> I guess I can just leave myself unmuted on both as long as there's not um, too much feedback. I also realize now for the folks on Zoom, uh, you know, if you're on a weird, if it's, you know, 5.40 a.m. for you and you've been on for over an hour, you can feel free to, to sign off whenever, no pressure. We're still going to be here for a bit, but um, I don't want you to feel like you have to stay on. <laughs> And Margaret, just make sure you remember to go to zero. Yeah, thank you. We're in position for you to uh, start your final IMA. Perfect. Thank you. Right, zero. Yes. Five. And... By the way, this is going to be this is going to be a tough mask uh, yeah. to deal with the clouds because uh, there's the guide stars are so faint. Okay. Thank you. 
Exposure complete. Exposure complete. DCD readout complete. DCD readout complete. All right, I'm going to do, I don't know, Laura, what do you think? The Y offsets 0.3. I'll do a send moves and retake, I think. You're you're muted. Yes, particularly for the rotation, we should retake. Yeah. Hmm. My dog just woke up. Where is she for the Zoom folks? <laughs> Exposure complete. Exposure complete. Um, do you guys think that there could be a benefit to perhaps trying to do shorter exposures if we're having the guiding issues or something that we could try to DCD readout complete. DCD readout if there's complete. A... And then like stack more with the Zendulus work about one. You could try. You could try that. It will add some overhead because the readout mm -hmm. takes yeah. time. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I'm thinking okay. about is read noise, whether we don't want to be read noise limited okay. on the detector. Um, it certainly helps from the point of view of cosmic ray rejection and those sorts of things mm -hmm. um, to have many exposures. Yeah, although I don't know. Should we just keep it at 1,200? I would do that. Okay. Yeah, 20 minutes that. isn't that long. Okay. Yeah. Would have turned class. And then I would just, you know, keep an eye out and if you have to end the out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just stop it the second I hear that <laughs> we're not guiding anymore. I may, I may stop, stop the screen, screen share, share and I wonder if wonder we should call the session to a close because we are well over an hour, of course. Mm -hmm. so happy to answer questions before we do the Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you very much. Hmm. Um, to answer, answer Darsha's Darsha's question, question. question, I'm getting a, a bit of an echo here. Let's see. Uh, to answer Darsha's question, uh, the Seifert part of the galaxy really refers to the nucleus of the galaxy, whereas the spiral refers to the large-scale structure. So um, it's a little difficult to compare. Seifert uh, galaxies can be spiral galaxies. The Seifert name refers to its nucleus, the properties of its nucleus, the black, massive, supermassive black hole and what's going on there. Uh, 
that's my understanding of preferred galaxies at least yeah that's my understanding as well CFRs come in different classes, CFR1, CFR2, depending on whether the, you know, the accretion disk around the black hole um, creates this sort of opening along the poles. If, you, if you're looking down the poles, then I think it's CFR1. If you're not, CFR2. Uh, it has to do with the orientation of the accretion disk of the black hole relative to us, not the orientation of the overall disk, but the, that accretion disk at the center of the black hole, which has no bearing on the overall orientation or the frisbee shape of the overall galaxy. Just like the solar system, and the planets around it form a plane, but that plane is nowhere near aligned with the plane of the stars in the Milky Way's disk. In fact, there's a 60 degree misalignment, in the case of the solar system's disk compared to the uh, galactic disk. Same way, the accretion disk at the center of the galaxy has its orientation has to do with the material in the immediate vicinity of the black hole not the overall galaxy disk okay i will stop the recording